strange 1.3 magnitude earthquake at Reading, Pennsylvania before the Montreal quake of 2.7 earthquake north of Montreal and the magnitude 5.1 at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. As you can see here, there's a lot of activity there. These are the earthquakes around that area of Long Island, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and the uh, few and far between earthquakes. The fault is in green. And we can also notice that we've had an uptick in earthquake activity on the East Coast. Those things that you see in the ocean around the 3 to 4 o'clock position is the 30 volcanoes, undersea volcanoes of the East Coast Seamount. They point towards Maine and uh, Rhode Island, as you could say, and uh, basically into the East Coast and uh, towards the area of Montreal and things like that. This is the area where we had an ancient supervolcanic eruption, and the geologists say it's a uh, quote-unquote Yellowstone-type caldera supervolcano area with multiple craters, multiple calderas, multi-caldera area there. They even found main eruption lava in uh, the British Isles. That was one of the biggest super eruptions way back. They say it was VEI 7 or 8. Let's go to the maps now to see what happened with our earthquakes that we had today in that area. Here we are at Sizemore Berkeley, and we'll have to go to oh, this one here. Okay. UTC 418 at uh, UTC 4849, uh, four four sorry, at uh, 129. And uh, this is UTC at uh, 4, 9 at uh, 2.59, about an hour later. And let's go here. And this was about 10 hours after the Montreal quake. So the first thing we had was the uh, Reading, Pennsylvania quake. Then we had the uh, Montreal quake. Uh, they don't plot these things on the USGS map, doesn't matter, we have it here on the Canadian map. You can see the activity that's going on here. This is the United States. Look at that, 3.7 in New York State. Well, the, the USGS have this at 3.1. The Canadians have it, as you can see, at 3.7. Okay, this was uh, on the 11th of March, and that shook the whole, they felt that all the way to Long Island. And this, of course, going out towards the seamount, three magnitude, April 1st. And uh, going back to this, 1.3. Sorry, going back. This is around Reading, right there. And they don't have a shake map or anything here because it was pretty small, but uh, let's go to our aerial. They don't have tectonics either. But we saw the fault, though, before that, basically going like this, splitting into a fork. And uh, let's keep in mind, you can, see the, you can see the folding of the mountains, the Adirondacks. Okay. And uh, this is the area... This is the beautiful area of the Mid-Continental Rift. The Mid-Continental Rift. That has magma under it going like this into Texas and then into New Mexico. And the other arm, it's like a horseshoe, and the other arm goes flanking the New Madrid Seismic Zone, which is the Real Foot Rift Zone. That's another rift there. And we have magma under there, and especially under here in Maine. Now, they do have magma under here, under that, but the geologists don't know where it's coming from, but they know it's there, especially all under the lakes. That's the huge part of it. And as you can see here, this is our seamount. Looks like there's more than 30. They say there's 30, but it looks like there's more than 30, but anyway. And it's pointing towards Maine and towards the northeast. And, of course, um, Montreal, Quebec, this area, which has, is full of craters, We're full of calderas. And this is our Google Earth map right here, where we've pinned the Quebec earthquake north of the Montreal. 
and the Reading earthquake. These are all past earthquakes, as you can see. Some of the pins, most of the pins come off, but that's okay. We have our um, trusty maps here which show a lot of the recent um, quakes in the past month. And plus these things here, although they take them off. So this is the one that's in the mid-continental mid-Atlantic ridge, the end of the American plate. And as we can see here, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that, uh, well, I don't, we don't know. Uh, do the Montreal and uh, Pennsylvania quakes have anything to do with that? This is the end of the North American plate. And this is where it joins the, Eura the um, Eurasian plate and the African plate. We have the Azores. Okay, that's a, a triple junction right there. And it's going back so we can see much better. How small the earth looks like this. Let's put it back. What's happening? What is happening? Okay. And coming back in. There we go. And they don't have much information as to what is going on there because they don't know where most of the faults are. They'll find them only if they have um, 24 people reported feeling it. Okay, what's happening here? Let's go back to this because we want to find out some more information. The regional information. And as they tell us, Lancaster. Lancaster County. Since colonial times, people in the Lancaster seismic zone of southeastern Pennsylvania, beautiful state. My sister lives there, so beautiful. Uh, Valley Forge, and there's a lot of uh, taverns, you know, where, where George Washington ate. <laughs> it's amazing. Anyway, um, they uh, have felt small earthquakes and suffered damage from larger ones. Earthquakes are felt once or twice per decade with some decades having none, and the 1990s having as many as six. Earthquakes in the central and eastern US, although less frequent than the western, are typically felt over a much broader region. East of the Rockies, the earthquakes can be felt over an area as much as 10 times larger than a similar magnitude earthquake on the west coast. A magnitude four eastern US quake typically can be felt at many places as far as 60 miles from where it occurred, and it infrequently causes damage near its source. A magnitude 5.5 eastern U.S. earthquake usually can be felt as far as 300 miles from where it occurred, sometimes causing damage as far as 25 miles away. Now, as far as the faults, earthquakes every, everywhere occur on faults within bedrock. And we know that faults are also rivers. Where you have a river, you have a fault. And we have a lot of rivers in uh, Pennsylvania, rivers and creeks and, and whatever. Usually miles deep, most bedrock beneath the seismic zone was assembled as continents collided from the supercontinent about 300 to 500 million years ago, raising the Appalachian Mountains. Most of the rest of the bedrock formed when the supercontinent rifted about, uh, apart about 200 million years ago to form what are now the northeastern United States and Atlantic Ocean in Europe. And I want to tell you what happened to Japan in 1,400 years, in 600 AD. I have to remember to show you that. In such a short time, how much Japan moved to the south. Now, at well-studied plate boundaries like San Andreas, California, scientists can determine the names of specific faults responsible for the earthquake. In contrast, east of the Rockies, this is rarely the case. Lancaster seismic zone is far from the nearest plate boundaries, which are in the center of the Atlantic Ocean and in the Caribbean Sea. The seismic zone is laced with known faults, but numerous smaller or deeply buried faults remain undetected, of course. Even the known faults are poorly located at earthquake depths. Accordingly, if any earthquakes in the seismic zone can be linked to named faults, it's difficult to determine if a known fault is still active and could slip and cause an earthquake. 
Now, I want to go to here. So, these are, of course, the, the mountains, as you can see. It's right there, very close to the mountains and all that folding and everything. As we said before, we have the volcano, the endosea volcanoes here, and we have uh, the mantle plume that's uh, the mid-continental rift, which geologists are not talking about. But we are, and we've made very many, very many videos on that. And let's go to uh, Japan. Recently, um, the scientists came out with why uh, they had seen red skies, like auroras, in the 600 AD. Uh, and I was surprised, and I, I did a video on that. I was surprised because they were, see, the, Japan here is at the, about the 26th uh, latitude. And they said it was, uh, so they don't really usually see northern lights up here. But it was eight degrees up more. I mean, these islands, the Japan islands, were somewhere up here. And the north island of uh, Japan is somewhere where the Kamchatka starts today. So uh, 1,400 years ago, this uh, whole part of Japan was up, up here. The island here was up at 35, right here. These islands were up here. So that means the whole of this was up here, which means that it was much northern, more north. And that's why they saw northern lights auroras 600 AD. Can you imagine what took place uh, 1,400 years ago to have this whole part of this earth come down here like this? Opening, stretching, uh, growing, growing? Because there's a lot of movement there, but that must have been a lot of some, a lot of, you can imagine what was going on there to have this whole thing, which is pretty long, coming down from this part of the northern, from here, to go all the way down here. Eight, de eight degrees. Eight degrees. Eight, eight degrees. So, you know, our Earth changes, we think that, okay, Earth is, shouldn't be moving, or it's growing and it's moving quite a lot. And that's what I wanted to show you before we uh, close this video. The thing with Japan, what happened. That's why they were seeing auroras, red skies, um, 1,400 years ago. They were much more north. So I'll leave links below for you for this. All of you there on the East Coast, please be very careful. And we're going to look at the earthquakes on the West Coast because we see that we have uh, more activity, of course, in Idaho, where we have that mantle plume. Uh, since we're here, something's going on. This is Yellowstone right here, and the mantle plume in Idaho is from here. And it goes like this and into Utah. Utah and into Baja. Like this. So it makes a seven shape. So we'll do that next. Thank you for your support. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.